I'm going to talk about developmental trauma in the way that I treat it, and hopefully that'll be uh, informative uh, to you. There are a number of approaches, but apparently uh, it uh, does, uh, you, you do best with a, a myriad of uh, approaches. Um, the, the disorder as a syndrome was uh, first proposed by Bessel van der Kolk, and um, this is uh, actually uh, a um, uh, publication in the Psychiatric Annals 2005, where he and a team actually uh, wrote up uh, the diagnostic description and uh, criteria for the disorder. Um, I don't know if it's ever going to make it into the DSM, but uh, it, uh, it certainly is an identifiable disorder. I've seen published uh, articles on the pros and cons of making it a disorder of itself since it does subsume uh, reactive attachment disorder and PTSD. And uh, it's the trauma aspect of this that van der Kolk has uh, spent his life uh, uh, researching and uh, developing treatments for. <clears throat> so I'm going to first uh, describe the disorder um, clinically, and uh, then the bulk of the presentation is going to be a case study, uh, which I think beautifully illustrates uh, what we're talking about and uh, how that might be different from just PTSD or reactive attachment disorder. I think you'll begin to see why it uh, there's a merging of those, that there is some kind of category that's needed that would encompass those two disorders and perhaps others. It is uh, being exposed to developmentally adverse trauma. Now, this would almost by nature mean uh, uh, early childhood um, because we're talking about traumatic experiences um, occurring uh, for a developing brain. Now we know the brain continues to develop through young adulthood. Uh, some wonder if the brain uh, continues to develop uh, ever, uh, but uh, if, you, if you've got uh, uh, young adults living in your home or uh, teenagers, d does, does this ever come online? You kind of wonder. You know? and, um, but uh, the brain uh, goes through intensive development, not only prenatally, um, but throughout early childhood and into childhood. So very significant uh, developments take place. And as you can imagine, uh, traumatic experiences such as neglect, abandonment, uh, uh, intensive emotional, physical uh, victimhood uh, is, is actually going to affect the brain. We know so much now about how important a relational attachment is to the development of the brain. So we're talking about people who basically, because of their early childhood experiences and the intensity and, and uh, this, the long-term ex, uh, exposure, have significant impairments in managing their emotions, in uh, forming and maintaining relationships, um, to the point that uh, they, they historically have been institutionalized and uh, uh, considered untreatable. But uh, some new uh, developments have come over uh, in the last uh, few decades, and so we're, we're seeing some, some real uh, uh, hope in that. So multiple chronic exposures to one or more forms of developmentally adverse interpersonal trauma abandonment, betrayal, physical assaults, sexual assaults, threats to body, bodily in, uh, integrity, coercive practices, emotional abuse, witnessing violence and death. Now it's a matter of degrees, um, but we're talking about severe. We're talking about over a period of time and uh, involving many factors in a severe way. Then there is the triggered pattern of repeated dysregulation, okay? So what sets up is the dysregulation of the affective system of emotional uh, modulation and control, and, uh, and this begins to affect just about all areas uh, of the self. Dysregulation, high or low, in the presence of cues. High meaning 
meltdowns, acting out, becoming violent, uh, whatever it is. Low meaning, you know, at one extreme, basically catatonia, dissociation, you know, shutting down, uh, exploding and imploding. In the presence of cues, uh, changes persist and do not return to baseline, okay? <laughs> and uh, these uh, over or under arousals do not, they're not redu reduced in intensity by conscious awareness, uh, which is a nice way of saying insight doesn't seem to help, okay? This is what's going on with you. This is why you're acting. It's, it doesn't, doesn't, this, this is, uh, this is a non-conscious neurological issue, okay? And um, so it's going to affect the affective domain, which would involve emotion, reactivity, arousal, the somatic uh, or body domain, physiological, motoric, and medical issues. These are individuals that are going to have some level of dysfunction, um, which will be manifested in various uh, vulnerabilities to medical problems. Uh, just an overblown stress reaction. Uh, and we, we know that uh, this kind of continued stress response just does all kinds of harm with our immune system and sets up a number of other issues, chronic pain, this kind of thing. Behavioral reenactment, uh, cutting, uh, the cognitive domain, thinking that it is happening again, confusion, dissociation, depersonalization, the things you would think of with PTSD. Uh, relational, and this is where the uh, attachment issues come in, clinging, oppositional, distrustful, compliant, you know, and if you've worked with these uh, kinds of kids, it's like needing comfort so badly, but reacting against it, you know, and um, um, self-attribution, self-hate, blame, incredibly um, insidious, persistently altered attributions and expectations or expectancies. Uh, in other words, assuming this is the way life is going to be, okay? I've been neglected, I've been abandoned, I've been beaten, I've been traumatized, I've been victimized, I've been exposed to God knows what, and this is life, and this is the way it's gonna be. You know, back in the day when we studied Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. Y'all still study that in school? I mean, I teach him. <laughs> you know, trust versus mistrust. We kind of come out of the womb and it's like our first crisis is, uh, is this going to be a good place or not? And uh, I think most babies, if they could talk, they would say, you know, we're not off to a good start here. Uh, you know, I was in a nice place, and all of a sudden I'm out in this cold, and, and there's bright lights, and, and were you spanking me? What is, what is happening, you know? Um, so uh, trust versus mistrust. Well, these are folks that definitely have decided this is not a trustworthy environment. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, distrust of uh, protective caretakers, um, loss of expectancy of the protection by others. You know, it's okay now. You're in a safe place. You're not living with those people anymore. Doesn't, doesn't sink in, okay? Um, lack of trust in social agencies to protect. You know, part of that is, okay, we don't want anybody to be too naive, right? Um, but the agencies that do many times intervene and uh, set up a rescue in, a, in effect, uh, those, those uh, are not respected by the individual. And it's because of their experience, maybe being put into a foster home where the abuse continues at some level, okay? Because these are children that are more likely to be re-victimized. Okay. <clears throat> Lack of recourse to social justice or retribution. Inevitability of future victimization, which is kind of what I just mentioned. And then finally, functional impairment. If you're going to have a DSM diagnosis, then how does this impair a uh, person? And it's incredibly impairing. Uh, educational um, delays, learning disorders, when your brain is on fire, 
you know, you, you really don't care about the capital of Wyoming, you know, uh, that kind of thing. It's just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a failure to cope. Familial, uh, peer relationships, social relationships, legal, um, they're many times at a disadvantage in uh, their legal rights being uh, respected or advocated for. Uh, and then later in life, uh, vocational issues if they're able to function to the point of working. <clears throat> okay, I have uh, the, the, the next slide has a little more information about the National Child Traumatic Stress Network of Therapies. Um, and I, I've got the uh, website there. They list 52 different types of interventions and they have a criteria uh, for what makes the grade. And these are usually um, encompassing forms of therapy that would address various aspects of a person's life with PTSD or children uh, with these kinds of issues. <clears throat> uh, cognitive behavioral affective approaches. Um, it's it's got to be more encompassing than just cognitive or behavioral or affective. I mean, you have to address all of these issues uh, with your therapy. Uh, medication is often used, not that it's uh, uh, the, the answer, but when you're dealing with issues this severe, there is no one answer, okay? Uh, you have to have a coordination of therapies, but medication in many cases uh, can make the difference between whether the child is actually able to appropriate other therapies. You know, it can provide some level of stabilization. EMDR uh, <clears throat> can be uh, very uh, powerful uh, uh, with clinicians who are skilled in using it with children. And uh, I'm going to talk further about neurofeedback or biofeedback. <laughs> neurofeedback is EEG or brainwave biofeedback, just one of the various types. And in my practice, we use various forms of biofeedback to get at the stress response. Not just EEG, but skin temperature, muscle tension, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what's called galvanic skin response, which is used in lie detectors. It measures sweat gland activities. It's a great indicator of physiological stress. And so people can learn with the, with the feedback of this physiology uh, to lower their stress response, and we will actually provide, once they get some basic control, we'll provide visualization of tr uh, triggers, okay? So it's kind of like a desensitizing behavioral therapy in that way. <clears throat> Various approaches. <clears throat> 52, it's, the website's very encompassing, I highly recommend it. <clears throat> I want you to take just a moment and uh, get to know the person sitting next to you if you don't already know them. <laughs> right. And, uh, or to get to know yourself. And uh, I want you to just uh, briefly share uh, what your experiences have been working with children with, uh, whether you would call it developmental trauma or not, uh, but let's say PTSD or reactive attachment disorder. Take about five minutes and just share with one another what your experiences have been, and, uh, and then I'll ask for a few volunteers to share what was discussed, okay? <laughs> I work in a local school district, and I've been, um, you know, honored and privileged to work with some of the families that have children with disabilities. Right. And I'm sharing with mm -hmm. Kim, my new best friend here, that um, in the 14 school years, I've seen such tremendous number of children experiencing, we can, of course, in the school diagnose, but what appears to me to be rad. Mm -hmm. And there's so many complicated uh, factors because there is, we're onions, all of us are onions, we have layers and layers. And some of these families with children with disabilities, you know, they're already struggling with being, um, you know, in um, low SES, low coping skills themselves, and then they have a child with disability that just, or two, or in some of my families that have three receiving services. In 14 years, I, I, I see more and more, and 
I'm glad we're talking about it because sure. the elephant is in the room. And oh, it's, ma'am. And yeah. it's showing up in, in our classrooms for those of us that work in, in the public school system. Um, and it's just heartbreaking because I'm a mom of a child that now um, she's 20. And, oh, Lord, thank you that I had some common sense in some areas because, <laughs> you know, um, she yeah. might still need a clinician when she gets to be an adult and say, my mom wasn't here or there. But can you imagine for some of our family that don't have right. the skills, right. like some of us in this room do? <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. So, yes, it, it is. Yeah, thank you. You know, I debated uh, about telling my daughter, okay, I've got some money set aside for your college. Uh, I almost said, or you can use it for therapy. It's up to you. you know? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, does anybody else have experienced uh, either in the classroom or clinic or something where you feel like there's just become an escalation of these severe disabilities? I'm a CPS caseworker. There you and, go. Uh, I have a 10 year old child right now who's been through two failed adoptions. And uh, of course, he's traumatized. So now he's acting up really badly in school. Right, he's right. He's just terrible at school. Not too bad in the home because he's around <coughs> with people, but he's doing terrible. And I know it's actually related to these failed adoptions and not just the original trauma that brought him in. But exactly. The rejection twice. Right. Yeah. And and that seems to be more typical than not that you know it's situation was bad enough but then it's like the helping process failing just exacerbates yeah. right the situation. Anyone else? We we work at a place that provides permanent supportive housing for single moms and their children. Oh, great, and so great. what we see a lot of times is there's like a recidivism where like the mother will have PTSD or trauma and then you, and issue where as a child she was in the foster care system and then now her child's in the foster care system and having behavior issues and so it's, I don't know if it's whatever she learned and now it's being passed on, you know, that secondary trauma. Right. The child has the secondary trauma or is responding <coughs> based on the mom's PTSD or what that is. But it's yeah, kind of, a, kind of an intergenerational yeah. transmission. Yep. And uh, uh, I think we all tend to parent like we were parented, right? That's the baseline. And if that was fairly pathological, you know, but you're working in uh, 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 working with uh, single mothers, mm -hmm. right? And uh, to give them some skills and support and that kind of thing. Yes, I'm great. Manager there, but um, our facility provides like wraparound services for um, it's housing permit supported housing, so we provide case management there. Wow. And um, uh, we have a clinician on site as well, and some other services there. And we can yeah. Or 20, families. 20 to 25, and this no, is uh, 20, families. 20 families. Oh, okay, yeah, wow. You know, I can I get kind of down in the mouth uh, even talking about these uh, kinds of situations, but then you have a discussion, you realize how many people are in some way plugged in uh, to uh, providing services. Uh, it's what it's going to take. 